listening to She Rises, a podcast dedicated to women who are ready to stop settling and start living their lives by design. If you're ready to talk about the stuff that weighs you down and get practical advice on everything from your health, body image, spirituality, relationships, and personal growth, then you're in the right place. Hello, I'm Giovanna Capoza, your host, master coach, spiritual teacher, and mind body expert, and I'm on a mission to unsettle women all over the world. Are you ready to rise? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I have with me here Crystal Andrus Morset. Crystal has been uh, on a show of mine before, back when I was doing another kind of radio show, and I'm so honored and excited, if you can hear it in my voice, really just to have her back on the show again. Let me tell you a little bit about Crystal, because she's absolutely amazing. I'm so glad she's here. From life as a homeless teen to coaching A-list celebrities, from developing abs of steel and competing in the Miss Galaxy pageant to weighing 220 pounds after being a mother. Emotional age and communication expert and women's advocate, Crystal Andrus Morset is now a worldwide leader in the field of self-discovery and personal transformation. A media darling, she's been called upon by Oprah, CBS, Fox, and the Daily Mail, and more. Crystal is the founder of the SWAT Institute, Simply Women Accredited Trainer, an empowerment coach certification exclusively for women that she created with fellow female visionaries such as Louise Hay, Marianne Williamson, and Dr. Christiane Northrup. She's the author of four best-selling books, including her latest release, The Emotional Edge. She is also a certified in nutrition and sports medicine. Welcome to the show, Crystal. Hello, darling. Yay. Hi. We're here together again. How exciting. We are. I had the honor and privilege of interviewing you. I think it's been a few years now for uh, another radio show that I was doing and now here on the podcast. I'm so honored and excited and just elated at the privilege to have you back on the show and interview you. I'm in love with your new book and yay, yay <laughs> and everything that you teach. It's uh, your woman after my own heart. And let's just dive in. I, I, I want to know so much more about the process uh, of writing this book. I, I know I've heard you speak about what a labor of love it was and, and how much you put into it. And and I know from other colleagues and people I've, I've interviewed, you know, what writing a book does for you personally. It's such a personal transformation. And the material in the book is, is transformative. So I'd love to ask you about your process of writing that and what that did for you. Yeah, the emotional edge. Oh, it really pushed me to my edge. I say there's a fine line between madness and mystic. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, I walked it and I never thought any, I never thought work or a project like that could bring me to the edge. And, and it's funny, you're the only person that's ever asked me this question. And it was actually, I was pushed beyond mental capacity. And I'll tell you why, just because I, I really tapped into the flow when I was writing this book and I almost got a little crazy because the information was almost like downloading into my brain faster than I could get it out on paper. And I'd never written like that before. I've journaled like that, but I I really had like a cracking open of information. I almost felt like I was being feeded and given and nourished with and all the right signs would come in the right moment. And finally, one of the signs was think for yourself. It sounds so silly, but... Mm -hmm. It sounds so silly, but as I was writing the book, I kept wanting to reference and make sure I got this right. And I was online all the time and on the internet and something just clicked. And I realized I needed to literally unplug from the world. And I did for about six weeks. I went offline. I went, didn't access the internet and I just let myself write and I cried and the stories that came through me and the healing from my own past and stuff. I didn't even know I was carrying such tremendous guilt or shame or fear or blame over. It was all coming up to the surface. And at first I thought, do I need to put all these stories in this book? And I realized afterwards, no, they'll probably go in my next one, my memoir, but they came up during the process of writing the emotional edge that gave me access to my own archetypes, to my own past, to my own pain in a way that, made this book just just something pretty pretty magnificent. Wow, that 
It's amazing. 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 And because, yeah, let's, let's just go there. I love it. Talk to me a little bit and talk to the audience about this. Um, you have this amazing play with archetypes in, in your own way, like in a post Jungian way, let's call it. And okay. especially this idea of the the child or the daughter, the mother and the woman. Like I, I love how you've broken them down like that. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I'd never even studied young <laughs> when this information came to me. Um, you know, it's amazing how sometimes you can think you are the the original inventor of an idea. Like it just comes to you and you're it's so new and it's so exciting and you feel like I've just created a new practical psychology. And then when I started sharing it, people were like, well, you know, Young had something. I was like, okay, I got to go learn Young. And, <laughs> you know, transactional analysis, that's what I'm getting at. It was like, well, the 70s, transactional analysis talked about the three ego types, parent, child, adult. And I was like, oh, I got to have to learn that. And then suddenly that's when I realized, no, you don't have to learn anything, Crystal. Shut it all down uh-huh. and speak from what is being given to you. So the idea does go along with a lot of the great thinkers. I'm going to put myself in there. Um, Young, who had the idea that there was sort of these three aspects to our personality, and he called it the ego, the shadow, and the collective unconscious, sort of this triad within each of us. Yeah, uh, you know, Freud, he had the three as well. He's called it the id the ego and the super ego, and sort of that the id was like this most primitive part of you, the most childish, selfish part of you. That's how I coined it. The super ego is sort of like this moralistic compass that is constantly trying to make you do better and be better. And to me, that's a lot like the mother archetype within us that wants us to be selfless and giving and nurturing. And then Freud said, we have this ego. And to me, that's the, well, and he said, it's sort of this balancing between the id and the superego. And for me, it all came together in a different way. What I realized is that within me, within each, within each person that I've ever coached, and then I spent about five years just making sure, like, do I, this is, wow, this is working. And that's the idea that we each have this child within us that is selfish and narcissistic and demanding and she can be difficult and a drama queen and rebellious teenager and I created all these fun archetypes because it makes it really tangible and easy to understand when I were to say something like you're just being a drama queen you get that or you're really a rebellious teenager you get that but then within each of us we also have this almost opposing although it it doesn't need to be and that's the work I do but we have almost this opposing part of our personality that's the mother archetype, the selfless, the giver, the protector, the doer for anybody, the wind beneath everyone else's wings. And then there's this woman energy, this adult archetype, this sort of transcendent beauty, this transcendence between these two sort of broken, not fully evolved parts of us, the mother and child. So I know I just made that seem complicated. I should have made it easier. But that's sort of it in a nutshell, that we are constantly trying to sort of balance these three. But it's when you come into your woman energy, when you really heal the part of you that's overgiving with the part of you that over wants, when you heal that place inside, it's called healing the split you just really step into the greatest expression of who you are and it starts to show up in every area of your life. Yeah, I love it. And the reason why I love this so much, the way you've interpreted it and created it and made it your own is because it's so applicable for women. No, I was going to say, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm constantly repeating to my clients and the women that I work with is this idea that our most important job is to learn to reparent ourselves. And that's why I loved it so much. I loved breaking it down this way because as you said, there are these splintered off pieces of ourselves that we judge, that we make wrong. And for so long as we're doing that, we're never really in that complete whole state of the woman, right? That final piece that that you termed. Yeah, I think through the course of our lives, we all have, well, some of us have literally trajectory changing traumas and moments and tragedies. Some of us just have sort of a slow, insidious breakdown of our self-esteem. I hate to say that, but Mm. along the way, we each have these experiences. And in that moment, we feel either embarrassed, ashamed, afraid. We feel something and we make a decision. I don't want to feel this feeling anymore. So we we kind of break off that piece of ourselves, how we just showed up or how we saw someone show up and we're mortified by it. And we literally, just like you say, it's splinter off. We just kind of break that piece off and we bury that in our subconscious so that one time when we're, when we're finally adults and we're finally ready and we have the time, 
we'll be able to go in and do the work and heal that stuff, but we never get to it. We forget about it. And by the time we're 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, we often look in the mirror and we like kind of don't recognize ourselves at some point. And it's because we've buried so many pieces and reclaiming yourself and repairing yourself, so to speak, you know, healing yourself, so to speak, is this gentle process of going back and finding all the splintered pieces and sort of healing your heart again, healing them back into the wholeness of who you are. And it doesn't take years of therapy. The way that I teach it, it is almost fun because you get to go in and find that little wallflower that you buried, or you find the perfectionist that you were ashamed of, or you find the charmer, or you find your addict or you're a rebellious teenager, and you get to know them again, dialogue with them, encourage them to come for dinner, and you, you, and you get to chat, and you and you get to meet each other. And then before you know it, you've got a whole bunch of you at the dinner table, and then one day you realize that you don't have this fragmented, shattered feeling anymore inside. You feel whole, and you feel solid, and you actually don't even find yourself having those conversations all the time with yourself anymore, because you're one again. You're back to being one, whole you. Amazing. I love it. And it's so, so important for us to do this work, like you said, because they, they go underground, don't they? And they start, they start running the show and yeah. you look at your life and you think, who said that? Or who, what's going on here? And it's because there's an eight-year-old running the show or there's, or there's another piece of you. Yeah, exactly. Or, and what a lot of us don't realize is that I call it our dominant emotional archetype. So we choose this persona to show up and that's, whatever you call it, your mask, or it's just the smartest in your mind way to present yourself to the world. So that's fairness. Like that's our most protective mechanism. So, but what we don't realize is that the reason we created that dominant is actually because under the surface, we don't want anyone to ever find out about all these broken pieces of us. They're the most shameful. They're the most, they're the shadow. So the shadow in essence, I call it our submissive, and you know, 50 shades of gray. Yeah. (laughs) Submissive, but in truth, it's the submissive that's under the surface that's always takes so much energy to keep buried because she's always at the dungeon basement door, bashing at the door trying to get out. So your dominant, this persona becomes exhausted after a while. And that's usually like for me, I was, I'm 46 now. When I was 40, I felt like, that's what I mean, mystic madness. I felt like I either want to check out, I don't even want to live anymore, or I'd rather either be the best, greatest, number one author in the world. There was this extreme duality. And that's when I was called. It was like, Crystal, you can't heal everyone in the world and not do it for you. So the persona of being perfect and fabulous and successful, amazing mother, amazing marriage, amazing life, amazing body, amazing, 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 was a, was a persona. And what I didn't realize that under the surface, I didn't want anyone to know that I was promiscuous as a teenager. I've been sexually abused by a few different men. I was you know, broken and shameful and tainted and I was wounded and and scarred. And so I presented my dominant, but in truth, under the surface, all that shame and sorrow was constantly battling to try to get out. And I needed to let her out and I needed to tell her story and I needed to stop shaming her or being afraid of her or mortified of her. I needed to allow her to have a place in my heart and in my life because it allowed me to get a little more selfish because isn't that crazy that I could be helping all these people and then one day I just wanted to end my life? And that's because I'd forgotten about me. I'd forgotten to heal me and my wounds and my pain and my little girl. And once I was able to do that, I, I, I can't even imagine thinking that way anymore. There's just no way I would ever give up on myself now. But I didn't realize how much I mattered. I just thought if I could make everyone else know how much they mattered, eventually I'd probably feel like I mattered and it didn't work. So I actually had to do the work to know, yeah, I matter. And so that's, that was my big madness mystic moment. It was huge for me. People talk about it, but until you walk it, it's really different. That's so, uh, so, so amazing. And thank you for sharing that because it is that it's that, that idea of, what you suppress or you hide, you end up projecting. So here you were wanting to help the world and, you know, save these women and really awaken the consciousness within and spirit kept leading you back to 
well, hang on now. This is, this is your work to do. This is your work to do. And this, we do this in so many different areas of our lives, don't we? Where we just project the outside. Got to fix this. Got to fix my weight. Got to do that. But it's really about what's going on inside. Yeah. And it, was, it wasn't that I wasn't, in fairness, I think I've been doing the work my whole life, which is what led me to mm-hmm. find that breakthrough. So I had been doing the work, but there was always another level. And there still will be again. And, but I'd broken through the lower levels of consciousness finally. And I'd broken through into the higher levels of consciousness where there's still work to do, but it doesn't feel like work the same way. And I'm lying. Right when I just said that, I'm lying because I'm exhausted today because I was up all night and I was helping my daughter with her work. So when I say that, there's, I'm, we all still have to keep applying. It's like brushing your teeth. You don't brush your teeth and get nice white teeth and then say, well, I did that job. You're going to have to do it every day for the rest of your life to keep nice white teeth. So I'm constantly having to recheck back in with myself to say, whoa, are you overgiving again? Like, are you ready to have a nervous breakdown again? Are you, <laughs> are you doing it? <laughs> like, grab yourself quick. Like, you know, hold on, wait, because I can get caught up on Facebook, answering people's questions. They're not, they're not even my clients. I'm not even getting any money. I'm not even being paid. But I could find myself sometimes where it's like, wow, I spent five hours just supporting people. And if I have the, a full well, it feels amazing. When my well is getting dry, I need to learn to step away and go do whatever must be done to fill me back up. And that will allow me to have that holy water left over for others. Absolutely. What a, it's such a great distinction. You can't give what you don't have. And, and like you said, this is a constant process. You know, one of the things that even just hearing you speak now and, and vulnerably share what I really love and admire about you is what a great communicator you are. And I know that that has probably most definitely come from doing this deep inner work. You talk a lot about that ability to communicate better once you have sort of uh, put yourself back into wholeness or at least worked on these pieces that have disassociated somehow. So can you talk a little bit about how, you know, the women listening, doing this work, there's, there's practical real world benefits that come from doing this deep dive work with yourself. Oh, it it improves. Like, let's be really honest here. We're going to do all this work for a reason to give ourselves a better life. Like, yeah. if I do all this work to just be feel like shit and be sad and broke, well, then you're doing the wrong work. So, you know, the, the ultimate outcome of this is that you have way better relationships. You're really able to, you know, I still, I, I, and the reason I do that five hours on Facebook is that I still, I have a level of sadness still sometimes for the way I realize people have not been given the tools to communicate. Their relationships are dismantling. They're losing the people they love most. I see some of them come on and write, I'm in my woman energy today and I told my daughter if she doesn't, she's going to be put in a delinquent, you know, I'm like, oh, that's not woman energy. Whoa. So what I'm trying to teach is when you have the practice of dialoguing with yourself, finding yourself, making peace with yourself, communicating better with yourself, it opens you up to being able to be vulnerable and communicative and honest and transparent with everybody you meet to bring out your highest good and their highest good. Because what's the point of a relationship if you're not bringing out the highest good in each other? Like, why do we want to have relationships to bring out the worst in people or have them bring out the worst in us? That seems so counterintuitive to me. So the point of all this work is you'll communicate better. You'll express your needs better. You'll understand what your needs are. You will learn how to hold space if someone doesn't get you and you don't get them. You don't have to sever relationships. You can literally have the ability to say, I don't know, we're just not seeing eye to eye right now. There's just a lack of communication here. And I think we should take a breather because I love you and I want a great life with you. And the worst thing I want to do right now is make this worse. So it's even teaching people just to have more compassion, better skills in terms of communicating and understanding and really seeing beyond the he said, she said. It's letting go of the obvious and it's being able to just climb higher in your life, which means 
honestly, I hate to make it about that, but it does mean more money. It does mean more love. It does mean more time for yourself. It does mean those things. And I don't mean it means Gucci handbags, but if you love a Gucci handbag and that's a dream, and like you said, or you want to have a great certain physique, or it, it is easier to get those things. Although I will tell you, those things will not do anything in terms of making you happier, but they're things. And we all have dreams for things. If you want a boat one day, cause you want to sail the Pacific or you want to, those things are great. When you get into your woman energy or your man energy, when you start to show up like an adult, those things become very attainable now because you're not living your life like a martyr or like a wounded child. And mm. everything gets easier when you become your best self. Yeah, because the idea that you're not actually seeking those things, those external things, whatever, if it's the Gucci handbag or if it's the the weight loss or the the boat or whatever it is, the idea that you're not seeking those external things to make you whole, but that you've already done the work to feel whole and that those things are just sort of icing on the cake, if you will. So no, it was this, uh, I love the point that you made about the not looking for those external things to make you happy, but that they come as a natural result of you having done this deeper work with yourselves. And I think it's great that you are making it practical and saying, these are the real world results of doing this work. Because I think so often, you know, what I see happening is whether it's women or men or people, it's like, well, no, I'm going to go after that. Like I want to you know, get business coaching because that's going to make me better. Or I want all these external things to work on when really the, the deep work ends up getting sort of discounted, but that's actually the foundation. That's the place to start. I love that you made that distinction. Yeah. And then I think a lot of us have already gone the route of trying to get the things. So in fairness, you know, I've been, you know, you read in my bio, I was the Miss Galaxy and, and the cover of all kinds of magazines. And then I came home and I was felt so empty that I thought babies. And not only did I decide babies, I decided I will eat whatever I want while I have get pregnant with babies. And I literally did gain a hundred pounds. And I almost feel looking back, it was conscious. It was like a conscious decision to say that thing didn't make me happy. So maybe this thing will make me happy. And then I had the babies and then I had the gorgeous house. And then I had the remodeled, beautiful, big kitchen. And then I had the Corvette and the minivan. And then I None of those things, they were, they were temporarily a high, but then they didn't sustain any lasting sense of peace inside. So now I, I have a lot of nice things, but I couldn't really give two hoots if, about them. Like, they're great. They're here. They're lovely. It's easy. It's, it's working. And if I had to let go of those things, no problem, because I have me. And no matter where I go, I go with me. And I like me. I love that. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're right. A lot of us have gone that route. In fact, you know, the world we live in today is sort of set up to do it that way. And I think that's why your message is so resonant with so many women is because we, we have all somehow, like I myself, you know, had the big home and the burbs and the, the relationship and the job and the, everything was good on paper. And I was, you know, at the time, 40, 50 pounds overweight. I was miserable we all have a story like that. I think that's why I love the way you yeah. tell it and teach it because it resonates across the board with so many women. Yeah. You know, I watched Beyonce at the Grammys and you know, she came out pregnant. I don't know if you saw her. Yeah. She, she was a queen. She was a queen. I saw, I literally sobbed through her entire performance. Like I actually had to get up. Like I was, I was crying so much, but my daughters get it now. We, we all watch together. And normally if this were five years ago when they weren't young women, they're 20 and 22 now. If they, they were teenagers, they'd be like, mom, what's wrong with you? You're crazy. <laughs> like they would just not got it. I just, I adore her. And why I adored her was that I felt like I am you, Beyonce. And the fact that she can make me feel like a queen when I watch her, the fact that when I see her up there, that she is singing for every woman from all time who has carried a baby or has been cheated on or who has been, who, who has felt like unless she's skinny, she's not, she was up there with her big pregnant belly, mm -hmm. the most beautiful I've ever seen her. She embodied, she showed us, she was mother, daughter, woman at those Grammys. She embodied the full whole self. And watching her, I just cried. And I thought to myself, 
When I watch her, I am you, Beyonce. I feel you. And when you can do that for people, no different. Adele got up and was still a mi- I love Adele. And more people probably in many ways love Adele because, well, you know, she's real and she's chubby and she's not perfect. And that makes it, well, that's great. And that's wonderful too. But Beyonce is an archetype. And I know that in her dark moments, I'm sure she cries and she has pain. But to me, she stood up there and it was the example of all of women's pain and magic and sorrows and triumphs and tragedies and wholeness. And it spoke, she spoke to me, like spoke to my soul. Uh. And so I think when I'm doing what I do and no, I'm not a Beyonce and no, I, I don't, but when I share what I share, I hope that I touch women in a way that can make them cry. The woman that needs to, the woman that can hear what I'm saying and say, Oh, she's me. I'm her. We're all the same. We got to come together, sisters. Like, I love the name of the summit that you chose. She rises. Mm. That's what Beyonce did on stage. That's what Adele did. That's what you do. That's what I do. We are teaching women how to rise into their greatness and to stand in their power. And you can't do that by going after the things. You do that by healing and finding who you are so that you know what things you even want. People do it backwards. They think once they get all the things, then they'll have the time. But you've got to first know who you are and what you want. And then you'll even know what ladder, where to lean your ladder. What's the point of leaning a ladder if you realize at the end of this life, you didn't even want things. You wanted to travel the world. You, You wanted to write books or you wanted to build a, a, a school. Like I'm saying things I've done because what if I hadn't, what if I'd stay preoccupied with being this galaxy mm. or what if I'd stay preoccupied with being fat or losing weight? What if I let my weight fat or thin determine how I would show up in the world? That would be a tragedy. Mm. I am fat and I am thin. I am sexy and I am so not. Because I'm all things. (laughs) And when you own that, that's your greatness. That's where it comes. And we have to be those role models to show other women. And sometimes it's literally talking. Like, why? Like, again, I go back to Facebook because sometimes I'm in these forums and I literally want to write and say, try speaking it like this and watch your results. Try talking like this to your children and watch your results. So we can't keep pointing the finger out there at everybody. Everybody is showing us, uh, us. Everyone is showing us who we, how we are really showing up. So if you don't like what people are mirroring back to you, you got to do the work on how you're showing up. Yeah, beautiful. I am. I'm like, I have so much like I want to put in here because it's so. This, I love this. I'm hearing your passion. I'm equally as passionate. I'm like, oh, I want to ask, I want to ask this. I want to go there. I want to talk about this. But we'll start with the we'll start with the first thing that came to me because I I saw I too I saw Beyonce's performance and it was amazing to me because I'm like, oh my god, this is so perfect, and I'm interviewing Crystal tomorrow. <laughs> um, it was amazing, and I I too I cried. It was so so moving to me, and something that you you really touched on there you know, there's this idea of doing this shadow work, right? And then there's this other idea on the other spectrum of that, of the light shadow, right? And this, if you see it in someone else, it's because you have that star quality or light to shine or whatever it is, whatever the distinction is that you see in Beyonce, this idea of the light shadow. And so many of us maybe just focusing on the shadow work or just focusing on where we're quote unquote lacking or need fixing. Can you talk a little bit about that light shadow and see that love that you just asked this because if we can't see ourselves in Beyonce, if we can't see ourselves in the greatest, then we are just, we're, we're holding ourselves back just as much as if just the way you said it, that dark, we, a lot of us think of the shadow as just dark. The shadow could be that you buried your greatness when you were little. Mm-hmm. You didn't just bury, oh, that broken, that sad time. You could have been, I remember being four years old and I have, I have a, I have a mean family. God bless them. I don't know why they, one side of my family are meanies. They are wealthy. They were mean. And that just happened. It, it's not that that has to be the combination, but it happened to be the combination. And I was a very sensitive little girl. And I re- and my aunt was only about 12 years, is only 12 years older than me. And my brother was two years older than me. And they were both just bully personalities. That's just their personalities. It's the archetype they chose. 
And I was four and I was dancing or singing something down by the pool at my grandparents' house. And my aunt said, you're not allowed to go swimming. And I said, yes, I am. I'm going swimming. However, I said it. And she <laughs> said, why, why do you think you can do whatever you want? And I said, because I'm, the, I'm a princess. And she flipped out and shamed me and embarrassed me and told everybody. And it was with a laugh and with a, and I buried my princess. And I spent so much of my life being friggin' Cinderella, the slave for the other princesses, until I realized, wait, I'm a princess too. I am Beyonce. I am I love it. I am that too. And if you can't see that, you can't step into your full greatness because you are that too. You, are, you, you can't just do the sad work of pulling out, oh, that sad story and that sad story without realizing you buried your greatness in along with the wounds. And you're going to have to find her too. Because if you can't say, I am beautiful, I am dynamic, I am smart and sexy and spiritual, I love who I am. I love my body. I love being in my own skin. I love being a woman. How are you ever going to create that? For yourself. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'll be really transparent here and share myself. I, for so, so long, judged myself for this, let's call her the star archetype that's within me. You know, I judged myself for so long. It's like, well, you, you can't do that and you can't shine that bright. And I, I write about this a lot, you know, sort of got to, got to stay in the dynamic of the family, you know, got to stay in that dynamic yeah. of the friends and people. And yeah. I denied it for so long and I judged it. I judged it because I thought, well, that's, you know, that's egotistical. That's beautiful. <laughs> that's straight up. You're the beautiful swan and I didn't realize I was too. So instead I walked around thinking I was trying to fit in with the, the, with the little ugly ducklings. And mm. what has happened to women like you and me is we've almost been shamed for being beautiful and big, bright lights. So we actually tried to bury some of our light so that we'd be likable. And then mm -hmm. you know what? We didn't like ourselves. And the people that don't like big bright lights are never gonna like us. And it's only because they buried their own big bright light. And that's all it is. I've learned that now. Yeah. When I see you and I see your magnificent beauty, you make me wanna be beautiful. You make it okay for me to be beautiful. I used to be ashamed of, I have an hourglass Zowie body. That's how God made me. <laughs> Zowie, I love it. I do. That's what God made me. My daughters are 20 and 22. I look at them and I, I feel this like, wow, Crystal, you didn't know you were that. You have, I have zowie, wowie, zowie, zowie, wowie daughters. No, <laughs> no, no plastic surgery. No. And that's how God made them. That's what they look like naturally. And I don't want them to be ashamed. And I don't want people on Instagram. I don't, but they're going to, they already get me in comments from women. They, it's always women, mean things. Someone wrote to my 22-year-old, like, like she looks 40, like the housewife, just a mean thing on her birthday. And I said, Madeline, there's always going to be haters. Yeah. You can't, you can't not be your gorgeous, fabulous, amazing, magnificent, bright light self because someone is jealous. Uh -huh. you You're going to make me cry here because, you know, I, 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 feel, I feel that emotion coming because... We, we, so many of us do, and of course I resonate with that and you resonate with that. It's like, you know, hiding our light or dulling it because heaven forbid you shine too bright. That's your ego. You know, there's all this judgment about that, but I see it with you and I see it with so many other leaders, you know, including myself, which is, which is what has made me create this podcast and, and start having a bigger voice because women need to hear that. And so who are you keeping back from your message or from your light? Like there's someone that's not benefiting if you don't shine. You know what? I have so many stories right down to, you know, I live out in the country in Canada, literally country, for maybe 400 people in our little town. And my husband plays on the team ball team. Like they have the ball, they have, you know, it's a lovely little town and then the, lovely little town. I get it. I moved here like friggin' 15 years ago. Do you think anybody in this town would still yet? It doesn't matter that I do retreats. I pe bring people from all over the world to my retreats. I have one coming up this weekend. Don't get me wrong. I'm slowly breaking in. But like I literally go to every one of my husband's ball games. I think I'm this great supporter. I whistle and cheer and I think I'm wonderful. But one night, the oldest guy on the team, 65, he's been on the team for 45 years. He has a little too much to drink. And he points in my face and he says, 
I hate women like you. You laugh too loud. You cheer too loud. I began to cry. Like it was the tears just started streaming down my, I didn't argue back. I didn't defend myself. And not one guy or wife on that team stood up for me. And I, I thought the old me would just tone myself down. But you know what the new me said? I don't belong here and that's okay. So I won't be coming to your games. Now you can imagine, Aaron says, those games suck now that you don't come. I said, well, you know what? Let them miss me in my big mouth and my bright light. And I will go where I'm wanted. I can't dim myself down anymore. I'm sorry. I laugh loud when I'm happy. I cheer for people I love. I can whistle louder than anybody in the world. But you know what? That's my personality. So if it's too much for you, you shouldn't have married me. (laughs) <laughs> and if I'm too much for you and I'm too much for my family, I would go to family events and like the women in my family would write me the day before, what are you wearing tomorrow? And I would think, I don't even know what I'm wearing 10 minutes before I leave. Like, I don't know. I'm not coming to outdo anybody. I'm not coming to, I'm just being me and I want you to be you. And I think you're amazing. And the ones that are quiet, I love your quiet gentleness because I can be that too. And the ones that are wild and have your fake eyelashes on, I love that because I can be that too. Yeah. Just, you know, and, and I'm just, we, we have to also celebrate our big bright lights because we can't just celebrate the, oh, we love Adele. Well, wait, hold on. We do. But what the friggin' hell can we not love Beyonce? <laughs> Exactly. It's not a competition. I, I love I'm it. I'm going back to that because I can't believe the haters on Beyonce. I put it up and my own sister says, I just can't do her. I'm like, you just can't do her? Yeah. Like, but well, again, this is the... I like, would have to write that. <laughs> my family has to write that. So I don't argue. I just go, well, I do do her. Oh boy, I do her. And Adele. Yeah, but it's, this, is the, this is the thing though is... Um, you know, where, where is that even coming from? Because, you know, I too, like I've seen, I've seen certain, uh, you know, stars or, or people get hated on for whatever. And you just wonder like, where is that coming from within the individual self? I mean, I've done it too. And it's like, oh, well, what, what's going on there? So, um, your buried self, your buried self mm-hmm. you're not her and you're not her. Yeah. Do you, you want to be like that, but you're so afraid to be like that. Um, yeah. you've judged yourself for being like that. So you're still judging yourself based on the people who judged you. So it's about emptying out all those stories and recontextualizing them so that your life works for you so that you realize every experience you went through, like the guy who yelled at me, that's not going to make me broken and sad. I completely forgive him. If I were to see him tomorrow and he would say, hey, Chris, I'd say, hey, don't worry about it. Oh, my God. Because guess what? You made me stronger. Mm. I love that you shared that story because it's, it's so important. And what I got from that is just this, how many times, like you said, my old self would have quieted down and played a little smaller to fit in, right? And you, you made the decision happened? to say no. I actually came home and unfriended everybody on his ball team. Awesome. Every single person I unfriended on Facebook and, and Aaron was like, whoa. And I was like, no, none of them stood up. I'm not saying they're all bad, but you know why? Do I know why Trump is the president of the United States? Because good people keep their mouth shut. Hmm. That's why. Because good people are afraid to say, well, I don't think that's, a, I don't like that. And so all the people who probably thought, wow, he's abrasive. They were afraid to say it because if you say a damn thing about him, you'll be attacked because I have been. I wrote one thing about Trump and I literally had probably 500 angry messages. I had a woman call me horse teeth. Hey, horse teeth. Like I just thought, who says that to another person? I have to say though, this is where when women want to attack another woman, where do they go for first? Their looks, always. Yeah, Yeah, so what is that comment? (laughs) Well, that's just to me, I just go, okay, but that, that's going to be there. So thank you. Mm. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you, Trump. Thank you, Trump, for becoming president. Thank you. Because you have just showed us all the underbelly of America and we can only heal the shadow if we'll shine light on it. Yeah. So we had, that had to happen. 
actually for us to raise our collective consciousness higher. That's actually made so many women come together like never before. Mm -hmm. Those marches were, they were monumental because women from all races, there were women with their, their headdresses on, walking with Jews, walking with white Christians, walking with atheists, walking with women who've had abortions, and women who will never have an abortion. Because we're finally coming together, and that's wholeness. And that's what you've got to do with yourself. You've got to come together. You've got to get your own Muslim and your own Jew and your own Christian and your own atheist inside of you and find wholeness. Beautifully said. I love it. I could literally go on and on and on. I, I feel like I'm like, can we do a part two? I just feel like there's so much to talk about. Um, but I really, really appreciate your insights, Crystal. And it was such an honor and privilege to be able to interview you again, and especially to speak about your latest work. Will you give us just, just before we wrap up, will you give us an insight into the training that you offer in the SWAT Institute? Because I think it's so important. Um, and it's such a yeah. resource. Thank you. www.swatinstitute.com. Just like special weapons and tactical, I say we're the new special weapons and tactical. That are <laughs> we're actually going to heal the world. We're not going to fight the world. We're not going to blow anybody up. We're actually going to take you higher so you can communicate, you can get neutral. So the training it, it stands for Simply Woman Accredited Trainer. And the training is exclusively for women because women are going to heal the world because when we can, all this, what we're talking about, we will be, we will be better mothers. We will be better wives. We will be better lovers. We will be better. We will just be better us. So the training, I, like I said, I went to, you actually read it in the bio, Dalai Lama came to Canada in 2009. He said, the Western woman will heal the world. And I sobbed just like I sobbed when I watched Beyonce. Mm. I sobbed. The Western woman will heal the world. We're being called. It was 2009. I went to Louise Hay, Marion Williamson, Christiane Northrup, uh, Colette Baron reed I just went to every woman that I thought, I love you. Will you join me in creating a program that will heal women so that they then can heal women so that they then can heal women? So we, I built the first program. It's our master empowerment coach certification. It's extensive. It's, it takes up to three years to complete, but it's for the lifelong learner that's going to be learning anyways. And at the end of it, she will know who she is, her message. Her, she'll be an, a stellar coach. She will be an incredible businesswoman, and she will know how to stand alone as a sovereign woman, but be part of a global coalition. Then we realized, man, there are a lot of women who are already medical doctors or coaches or whatever that, real, that said, well, I don't really want to do that three-year program. What if I could just learn your coaching process? Because I have a very unique style of coaching, and it is based off of my book, The, the Emotional Edge. It's based off the empowerment spectrum, so it actually really teaches women how to heal the split, rise higher in their level of consciousness, so they show up differently, and they see things differently. So that we then call, we created a sort of a fast-track three-month program that's just the coaching intervention, and uh, that's our personal empowerment coach certification. So we have the two certifications, and um, yeah, we're, it's starting to go. I got to tell you, we're in 30 countries now. You know, I have a woman that just signed up a doctor, a physician from Ethiopia who has signed up to our master program. We have women from Kenya. We have women from the Middle East. We have women from all the, you know, Western nations. So it's incredible. And I, I feel like I'm this, the mama bird of it all. I'm the mommy. <laughs> I protect all my women, but I still have to remind myself because I do sometimes become this fierce matriarch and I need to remind myself, you're just a woman. Go have some fun. So, <laughs> Shake it out. Yeah. Be loud. <laughs> yeah. Go whistle. You don't have to heal everybody tonight. You can go dance. So I that's love it. I love it. Well, this was such an honor. Guys, you will find the information for the SWAT Institute in the show notes as well as a link to where you can find uh, Crystal's amazing, most recent, I'm going to call it a work of art because it's just amazing, uh, The Emotional Edge. Crystal, thank you so much for sharing your voice, your energy, your passion, and this beautiful work that you're doing in the world for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. You likewise, you are a soul sister to me. And I can't wait for us to finally meet in person one of these days because I got to give you a great big hug. I just adore you. Uh, likewise, I feel the same. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for tuning in and keep rising everyone. For books and resources related to today's episode, make sure you head over to SheRisesPodcast.com and I'll see you there. If you've enjoyed today's episode, make sure you tune back in next week when I dive into more juicy topics to help make your life the best it can be. And hey, if you've enjoyed listening to the show and you love it, head on over to iTunes and leave me a rate and review and subscribe there to the show. 